Now we turn to uh, air quality. Nine out of 10 people around the world are breathing dirty air, with 95% of residents of C40 cities living in areas that exceed WHO's guidelines for air pollution. Even in the wealthiest cities, people in vulnerable and marginalized neighborhoods are exposed to the dirtiest air, as these populations tend to live near busy roads, industrial areas, and other sources of pollution. We'll now hear from mayors and experts how cleaning the air, using the latest science and technology in cities can help create a healthier and more equitable society. So I'm pleased now to welcome to the stage our moderator for the next session, Ansa Williams, head of the environment program at Bloomberg Philanthropies. Welcome up here, Ansa. And panelist Anna König Jalmir, Mayor of Stockholm, Director General of Beijing Municipal, Municipal Ecology and Environment Bureau, Mr. Chen Tiang, uh, Horst Munis Wells, Mayor of Lima, and Dr. Maria Nera, Director of Public Health, Environment and Social Determinants of Health Department, also at the WHO. Welcome, all of you. My name uh, is Antha Williams. I'm the head of environmental programs at Bloomberg Philanthropies. And we have a fantastic group of panelists here today um, on the front lines of the, the fight to clean up our air. Um, just to situate us a bit, um, at Bloomberg Philanthropies, our mission is to ensure better, longer lives for the greatest number of people. And of course, dirty air is a huge threat to better, longer lives. Um, we heard from the Secretary General, there's seven million people a year um, who die prematurely um, because of the risks presented by, by dirty air. And it's pretty astonishing that 95% of residents of C40 cities, the leading cities in the world, are living in areas with dirty air. So it's quite an urgent topic um, for all of us to confront. And as I've said, we have a, a great group of panelists to, to address that with us today. Um, I want to turn first to um, Mayor of Stockholm, uh, Anna, Anna uh, koenig Um As a C40 vice chair uh, and one of the many signatories of this morning's declaration on clean air in cities, um, how would you characterize this new declaration and what does it mean for the work on the ground in Stockholm? For us, it helps us push impact and measures forward, especially when it comes to the national level and to put pressure uh, on the national governments to help us find new technique, in, especially for monitoring air quality. Because we all know about the risk when it comes to health with bad air quality. And we also know what the cost is. That's why World Economic Forum said that in Davos, said that just climate change is, is the biggest threat to the world's economy ahead. So it's both economically um, costly and it's a loss of production. And these kind of arguments we can also bring to the national level. And uh, we are doing a lot in the city when it comes to congestion charges. We plant tree, um, we work with fossil fuel free buses all over the city, um, and we have um, a bid on, uh, we have forbidden studded tires because we are a cold country with a lot of snow. So in some area, we have forbidden studded uh, tires. But what we want is real time uh, monitoring of air quality and to have um, um, emission zones that could be dynamic. But we are now not allowed to have that when it comes to legislation. That's one example that we are trying to push, push the natural level to give us the tools needed ahead. Because then we can have monitoring in the city, real-time data, and dynamic emission zones instead of permanent zones, because that is much more uh, controversial, I would say, 
So that's a few examples, but as a city, we reduced our CO2 emission by 60%, but now we want to go even further, and then when we bring the data and the new technique, I think. That's a, a great example, and um, Mike Bloomberg often says, uh, you can't manage what you don't measure. Yeah. I think we see in cities around the world the importance of the real-time monitoring, yeah. both for policy making and also for engaging the public. Um, I want to turn to our representative from the municipal government of Beijing. Um, Beijing, of course, has quite famously worked to confront its air pollution challenges and seen quite some success over the last five years. I hope you could speak to what specific measures you've taken and whether there are any of those measures that other cities across the C40 network um, could implement. And I want to remind people, uh, you have translation devices if you need them. We're doing um, multiple languages across our, uh, our panel here. Uh, okay. Discussions and to share with you some of the experiences of Beijing. Building a beautiful home is mankind's common aspiration. And breathing fresh air is, of course, our common pursuit. Since 1998, we began to control pollution. So it's been about 20 years. So in the last 20 years, we've realized marked air quality improvement against the backdrop of social as well as uh, economic development. We've managed to create a win-win situation. In the last 20 years, the population of Beijing, of course, has grown very rapidly. It has increased by about seven times GDP, 11 times, and motor vehicle population is about 6 million at this point. At the same time, we've seen an improvement in the air quality in terms of the concentration of the main pollutants has decreased about 40%. And with other, such as SO2, NO2, decreased about up to 95%. Due to time constraints, I'm going to limit my discussion to just some key points. One is the improvements is a result of scientific um, research and improvement. This includes some of legal uh, legislation, legal measures, and economic measures. For example, we have some incentives and subsidies, as well as um, science, science and technology measures, so that, for example, we also monitor w the position of Beijing when it comes to the uh, levels of pollutants. And we also increase um, our control of pollutants and also raise awareness of the public at large with regard to how serious um, the adverse effects of pollutants. So we focus on coal combustion pollution. So we use clean coal. In the last few years, we've decreased the use of coal by 90%. So SA2. It was more than 120 uh, million micro 120 micrograms per cubic meter has been decreased to only five micrograms per cubic uh, meter, and of course, in terms of um, public transportation, we've also been optimizing the uh, facilities that are provided, and we also have very high standards when it comes to emissions and oil quality. So we realize the pollution problem in China, and specifically in Beijing, is very serious. So we try to eliminate the uh, old uh, model of vehicles so that we increase um, the new vehicles um, for example, uh, taxis are now electrified. We use electric vehicles for taxis and also increase the number of electric vehicles for public transportation. And also, we also have a catalog of uh, pollutant industries. So 
we remove more than 3,000 polluting companies from the cities. And industries are also asked to apply cleaner production and environmental friendly technical reforms. And also what's worthy to be mentioned here is that we also link the regions in Beijing in terms of the um, control. For example, Beijing is more than uh, 16,000 square uh, kilometers in terms of land area. So region to region connection is very important so that we can synergize the pollutant control as well as information sharing. So together, the regions, the, the areas or the districts work together. So this year, in March of this year, at the UN Environment, uh, I understand the UN Environment released a report on Beijing's air pollution control process in the last 20 years and has indicated that Beijing's experience is interesting and can be shared with other cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. I think you, you touched on um, a few um, important themes, some of which um, Mayor Koenig, your mail, picked up as well in terms of what the national government can do. So um, a lot of tools in the toolbox in China in terms of um, the work at the national level on policies that, for example, close coal plants uh, in order to clean up air pollution or procure additional electric vehicles, where China, of course, is, is quite a leader. Um, I want to turn to uh, the mayor of Lima, Peru, um, Jorge Munoz Wells, um, to ask about the um, C40 um, Clean Air Cities Declaration of this morning, where 35 C40 cities have, have now signed on. Um, and as a signatory to that declaration, can you share some of the key measures that you plan to take in the city of Lima to clean up the air and meet the commitments of the declaration? <clears throat> Sí, eh, primero que nada, muchas gracias. Yes, firstly, I would like to thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel in order to share with you the situation in my country. Lima is the capital city of Peru. It is a huge city. It has more than 10 million inhabitants. It is a city that uh, is facing many challenges. And what we have done is to take um, citizens and um, make citizens the center of our city management. We all have the right to a clean air and we all have to make efforts to achieve that clean air. And there are different sources of pollution. It has just been said that 90% of people worldwide um, are breathing dirty air. And in Lima, I would say that that percentage is even higher. And this is due, for example, to internal combustion engines in vehicles. It is also due to wood stoves in um, the suburbs of cities. So what can we do? What are the specific measures we can take so that citizens are at the center? Well, we can carry out different activities, different measures and actions. And in Lima, firstly, we have signed this declaration, this declaration on clean air cities, but we are also taking action because as Aceti already said, this is the decade of action and we must take action. And that is what we are doing. What the first thing we have done is have a whole network of measurement stations to know what the situation is and how we can move forward. We have also started introducing uh, catalytic converters in municipal vehicles to um, serve as an example of um, how to have vehicles that do not pollute. We are also cooperating with restaurants to reduce uh, their emissions and the emissions from their stoves and kitchens. But we are also carrying out other policies. For example, we plan to plant uh, 2 million trees in the next three years. 
this is this is one of our most important policies. And in order to carry it out, we have uh, established an alliance with many actors in um, our city. We believe that SDG 17 is uh, fundamental and we must make the most of it. We must create alliances to achieve specific goals. But we also have other projects in our city which are vital. For example, we are creating more pedestrian areas in the center of Lima and we are also promoting the use of non-polluting vehicles such as bicycles for example and Copenhagen is a perfect example of this we still have a lot to learn in this sense but we are slowly moving um, towards uh, this uh, these pedestrianized areas and we also would like to become an example in this sense thank you very good thank you so much um, one uh, element that you touched on is the um, the state of the art, um, which we're seeing across C40 cities, air quality monitoring, source apportionment, and then air quality management systems, which increasingly I think are, are taking off and, and can be replicated even as we begin to think about um, the lessons beyond the C40 network of cities. Um, I want to turn to uh, Dr. Nehra from, from the WHO, the World Health Organization. Um, the World Health Organization plays such an important role in just signaling the level of priority of um, air pollution as a risk factor. Um, at Bloomberg Philanthropies, your work is very close to our heart because Mike Bloomberg serves as an ambassador to the World Health Organization on non-communicable diseases, air pollution, of course, being a, a really leading risk factor. So I wondered if you could just talk to us about the um, World Health Organization guidelines on air quality and, and what they mean for cities around the world. Yes, thank you very much, and we appreciate enormously what you have achieved this morning. The declaration that was signed this morning is absolutely fantastic because we will contribute to reduce this figure that has been mentioned already several times, the seven, the seven million premature deaths that according to WHO estimates are dying every year due to exposure to, to air pollution. I think even if everybody has repeated this figure, I don't think we realize what that means. We are talking about almost the city of Lima uh, with 10 million disappearing every year. Imagine the population of Lima, 7 million of Lima disappearing every year, and that is totally acceptable. It makes air pollution one of the biggest public health challenges we are facing today. So why the, the air quality guidelines? We look at, at what we are breathing, how toxic it is, and what it will represent, what will be the level of pollution that will be acceptable. And there is no level that is acceptable. So that's why we call about air quality guidelines. We put it, we look at the PM 2.5, which are the ones that are more dangerous, and we set a limit. 95% of the global population is breathing air that is going beyond that limit. Obviously, it's not the same. Uh, uh, the limit can be twice the recommended by WHO if you live in cities like Estocolm or Copenhagen. It's almost there. You are almost there. And obviously, it goes maybe 20 times more if you live in other cities that maybe we don't need to mention, but I'm sure that you all have good examples. Let me just to tell you, I, I'm a medical doctor, I'm not a mayor. I would love to, because I understand that you have an incredible power and, I, and, and you know, no pressure on you, but uh, the world today is urban and the health today is urban. So no pressure, but be aware that you are a little bit ministers of health as well. And the health of the population is very much on your hands. Those, the toxic air that we are breathing it goes to our lungs. That is clear for everybody. Normally, our lungs are pink. What we see now is very dark lungs of people who never smoke. So we have 17 years old uh, teenagers that they have the lungs of a very old uh, smoker. They look like uh, they have been smoking for 30 years and their lungs have been exposed to that. This is totally unacceptable. But the thing is, 
I don't know how many of you have been uh, presenting or having yourself an asthma crisis. Believe me, if you have one, you will never forget it. This anxiety, the fact that you cannot breathe, is terrible. But it's not just asthma. The air pollution can cause lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, pneumonia, and then stroke, and then uh, uh, as well ischemic heart disease. So all of those non-communicable diseases that Mayor Bloomberg is such a champion on that, but unless we tackle air pollution, we will not be able to finish with those diseases. The bad news, the air pollutants that are reaching our lungs, they, most of them, the smallest one, they go to our bloodstream. And from there, they can reach every organ, including our brain. And the bad news is that today we have thousands of scientific evidence papers that are proving that our brain is affected as well. So imagine that our cognitive function, so our intelligence, is at risk. We are decreasing our IQ. Our cognitive function as a society is going down. So we are getting a little bit less intelligent than we should be. Maybe this is the reason why we are not taking more action against uh, the air pollution. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> the time is not right to be losing our, uh, our intellectual ability because the challenges have never been bigger. Um, I think those are some very sobering um, statistics. And to underscore the, the 7 million people per year who are dying prematurely um, from air pollution, that makes uh, the that makes air pollution the fifth leading risk factor um, of any problem in the world and the leading environmental risk factor. Um, I think the good news for, for our work is that the exact same um, policies and programs that we can use and implement to combat climate change also clean up air quality. And so, um, Mayor, I'd like to, to turn back to you to speak to the fact that you've set both these very ambitious air pollution and also climate change targets. Um, and what are the opportunities that you see to tackle those twin challenges together? I, I can see that both that we can collaborate cities uh, in C40, for example, to get inspiration because even though we, I represent a city that has we have better air quality than ever, I would say. In fact, but we still, you know, we are measuring some streets. We want to make measures and we, because our citizens know exactly if the air quality is bad, um, they will let us know because they can feel it. And if we, if we can present the data, they will also um, put pressure on us. That's why it's so important with this transparency um, towards the citizens. But of course, um, I can also use this in my international network in, in Europe. Next week, I'm, I'm meeting the Franz Timmermann, who's the vice president of the commission, and talking about his new uh, green um, deal and how we can work together with that to, to push European countries on a member state level even further and how we as a city also can use our momentum to you know, make the nation states more, more ambitious because we need that. I talked to my colleague in Warsaw and in Warsaw a baby one year old has so much uh, congestion it's about 1,000 cigarettes from the year one, so it's really critical now. So we have to, to really work together with all the citizens. And, and that's why we, are, why we are here and why we are pushing and this kind of declaration forward so we can have the right effect on our measurements. That's great, thank yeah. you so much. Um, Mayor Munoz-Wells, I wanna turn to you with this um, question, but then I, I'll just fair warning to the other panelists. I'm gonna ask you to answer the same question in rapid, rapid fire uh, succession as our, as our wrap up question. Um, but, but Mayor Munoz-Wells, a, a child born today uh, will be 31 years old in the year 2050. It's a year we talk about in terms of a lot of our climate and clean air targets. What, what do you hope the, the air quality will be like in Lima in that, in that 31 year period? Um, and what are the actions that need to take place now to make that vision a reality? First of all, you have to be aware of what is happening. And you have to have a very clear politic. You have to tell people 
the action plan, you have to explain it, and then you have to act. And there are a lot of concrete things that you can do, um, very clear things uh, in my country and in other countries as well. Whenever there is a government change, the action plans, uh, uh, well, just stop and they said, oh, I start all over again with something else. Uh, so we have to plan really for the future. And uh, we have to have a governance that permits that these things uh, really have an orientation towards the future and will not be interrupted. And we, um, um, I, I listened to the doctor, and uh, it really uh, is something that is happening in all cities. Uh, these are non-transmittable diseases that everyone has in cities. And of these non-transmittable uh, diseases, um, well, it's because of the air, because of uh, the polluted um, water. And we have to deal with the situation, but with clear actions. I just told you that we have to be prepared for the future. We should prepare for 2050, and we have to have very clear ideas of what we want to reach, what we want to um, achieve. And now we have a recuperation plan for the historical center of uh, Lima. And this will allow us uh, to show a concept that is very important, uh, that people should walk. People don't walk. People should walk more. Um, to come from point A to point B, and they will be healthier if they walk more. And this is also a change of paradigm. Um, and then I will stop because uh, you asked me to be real quick. And we want to change the model that everyone needs to use a car. In South America, in Peru, um, a car is just a sign of status. Everyone, people just don't walk. They uh, use the car all the time. And we want to destroy this philosophy and say, well, the pedestrian should be number one in the pyramid of mobility. And uh, this is a non, it's a very healthy mobility. And then after that, it will be public transport. So this is our vision for the future. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chen Tian, I will uh, ask you to answer the same question, but very quickly, three sentences. The vision for uh, Beijing's air quality 30 years from, from today and how, how you get there. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we have already very excellent results uh, in Beijing, but we still have not met global standards. So we will continue to do what we do best, which is to control and monitor air pollution, and as well as other pollutants. Furthermore, I think in the last 20 years, We've seen the achievements of Beijing. And how have we achieved this? Because we've learned from our international partners. So I think it's important to learn from each other to create a beautiful future. Thank you. Thank you so much. With, um, with apologies to our dear mayor of Stockholm here, I'm going to skip you. And it's only appropriate, I think, to close this panel with a um, medical doctor. And I, I loved your um, takeaway quote that the mayors here are also ministers of health. So I'll ask you the same concluding question to have our last remarks. Well, uh, that will be my prescription. Since I'm a medical doctor, I will prescribe. You know, this is what we do best. So, so my prescription to you is measure your level of ambition on the number of lives that you can save the number of asthma cases that you can reduce. We can do that for you. I know that the first part of my presentation was very negative about diseases. Now is the positive part. Any action you take to improve the, the sustainable transport, to remove from Beijing all the industrial processes, all the measures you are putting, you are generating health benefits that can be quantified. We can do that as WHO. We can sell it back to you, and you can tell your citizens, look at how I am protecting your health. Of course, if you do it in one year, uh, you will save a lot of lives and quality of life. If you take 30 years, uh, it depends how many lives you think are acceptable, how many deaths you think are acceptable. So my prescription is your level of ambition will give you votes, and you can measure it on the health benefits of that. Thank you.